chairman of the delegation of India. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, and fellow delegates, call to this rostrum at this stage of our commemoration proceedings and as the last speaker on your list, it behoves me, as it does indeed give me pleasure and happiness, to convey to you, Mr. President, on behalf of my delegation, the thoughts that I am sure is in the minds of all of us who are gathered here, even though I have no authority to speak to the, for them, of our grateful appreciation of your presiding over this commemoration proceedings during this week. May I say, Mr. President, yes, for the great cosmopolitan character of this place, and also that where there is goodwill, barriers of nationality, of race, of culture, indeed of political opinion, need make no difference to the sense of fraternity. <laughs> Next, Mr. President, my delegation would also like to convey our respectful thanks to the head of the, of the host state for the welcome, uh, the President of the United States of America, for the welcome he, have, he accorded to us when in, in inaugurating this conference and for the message that he convey, conveyed to us from his supreme legislature. You told us at the beginning of this gathering, quite rightly, if I may say so, that this was not a session of the General Assembly, but it was a commemoration meeting. And therefore, it would be more appropriate if we can find the ourselves the general observations, indeed, you thought you are giving us, giving us a warning that we should not go about looking for the trees, but merely at the wood. This, however, is a commemoration. And we would like, to, like to, to have the privilege of mentioning another name, of a great, since we are today celebrating the anniversary of the signature of the Charter, of that soldier statesman, Field Marshal Smuts. Such are the differences that my country or my government may have with those associations of the late smuts do not enter into this matter. And we are pay our tribute to a great man who served his country and the world well, a gallant adversary and an honorable foe. A historic occasion, a commemoration, Mr. President, is an occasion for recollection, with to recollect with detachment, to evaluate in perspective, to think imaginatively, and to dedicate with humility. In doing this, it would not be appropriate to recount the resolutions that have been passed, the various institutions that exist, and all those other matters which would be appropriate in a survey at the, at the, at the, at the general debate or the General Assembly. Our recollection, therefore, is largely with those highlights, I don't mean highlights in a spectacular sense, but with those things that strike the consciousness of men. And first, therefore, the feeling that we have in that recollection is that the United Nations has been worthwhile. That seems a very simple statement, but that is the, out, the, the foremost impact that it makes upon ourselves. The very fact of this commemoration, we would not be commemorating it, com commemorating but performing an inquest if we were a failure. We commemorate because we want to remember. Com we commemorate because we want to reaffirm. Secondly, Mr. Chairman, For the organization of aid and support, and what is more in its very early days, in pursuance of the implementation of its basic purpose, namely to save the world from the scourge of another war, addressed itself to the problem of disarmament. The further highlight, the further effect that projects oneself into this consciousness is the statement that was made by the President of the United States to the, the, the eighth session of the General Assembly when he announced the willingness of the United States to take the initiative and to make a contribution toward the peaceful uses of atomic energy. Now, I like to say that this was the first proclamation when war was forced to give up its monopoly over the atom. Until then, at atom, atomic power, were regarded as part of war apparatus. Now, Mr. Chairman, as an Indian, there is one other fact which, if I may say so with your permission, stands above all, above all of this, which projects itself 
in one's consciousness when one talks about recollection. Eight years ago, on a January afternoon, the flags of the nations of the United Nations in Lake Success came down at half-mast. Representatives of the many nations gathered together to pay tribute to a man whom they had not seen, who had no organic connection with the United Nations, who probably never read the Charter, who was not a, 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 a politician or a statesman in the normal course of things. There, were no, there was no protocol, there was no rehearsals, it was an unrehearsed event. And the significance of that to us, not that a countryman of ours, a great man of our millennium was so honored, but the United, St United Nations proclaimed itself as the adherent of the gospel of peace and of peaceful pursuits. Mahatma Gandhi, if there was... In Mahatma Gandhi's life, if there was one thing more than other that we, now part of the world, constantly try to remember, was that he taught and lived the idea that there was no distinction between means and ends. Means were ends. And today, we have to remember that means are ends. We cannot make peace with war. <laughs> References have been made to the Conference of Asian African Countries which recently met in Indonesia in that beautiful city of Bandung. No description of Bandung, no account of Bandung would not be complete without two things. One is about the beauty and general equability of, of climate and weather of the city itself, and the other is the magnanimous hospitality and the great enthusiasm of the Indonesian government and people. We would not have been able... <laughs> At Bandung, whether anybody came from Arabia or China, or from Africa, or from Indochina, they were at home. As my Prime Minister said, for a week, Bandung became the capital of Asia and Africa. It is not without significance, Mr. Chairman, that this conference has attracted a great deal of attention, but I think it's important for, for me to state that it is not an adventitious occurrence. It is Bandung, which is the expression of the resurgence of Asia and Africa. It is not a nice six, seven days wonder. It expresses the personality of the new nations of these countries. And if you, I, I, the time at my disposal, I could only again go into the highlights or to the more important features of this gathering. It's important that at, at, at Bandung, no one's hand was raised against anybody. It was not a, an attempt to found a regional organization. It was not an expression of Asian compartmentalism. It, Mr. Chairman, it helps me to refer to my own country in relation to the life of the United Nations. India is a loyal supporter of the United Nations, houses some of its activities, and both receives and gives technical assistance and other forms of economic and social cooperation. You left behind the moment you had mentioned it. That future we look, and we hope that this commemoration meeting of ours will not merely be a day of recounting, but a day when we wish that this future would, would shape and mod model itself in terms of the Charter of the United Nations. Leave aside those things that are, are unessential and concentrate on the essentials. We could do that only if we are prepared here and now to have a reassessment and reevaluation of our own ideas. Mr. Chairman, may I say with great respect, we have to take into account, first of all, that since the founding of the United Nations, since the Charter was signed, there has been an epochal, a great, a revolutionary change in the world. And that is, we have evolved into the atomic age. And therefore, whatever we may have thought, whatever measurements we may have had, whatever ideas of war and peace we had, whatever ideas of distances we have had, they do not, no longer hold good. And unless 